get there with you, but you will get to the promised land. Because God has allowed me to go over the mountain and I look over and I see the promised land. And I'm so certain he knew he wouldn't get there. He softened it for us rather than say, I won't get there. He said, I may not know him full well that he would not. He never thought he lived to be 40. He was 39 when the bullet hit him. Hold fast to your dream. For a dream to die, you were like a broken wing bird. That cannot fly. But by the next day, he was all right. He is where I'm going to live that he had preached himself through the fear of death. He preached it out of it. And he was lighthearted the next day or before. He and Andy Young had a Philippite, first thing in the morning. <laughs> I told him dinner was at 5 o'clock. I didn't know it. He called the house. They told us dinner was at 6. So when I went to get him at 5, he said, oh no, dinner's not to 6, and I'm in no hurry. Take a seat. <laughs> he was never in a hurry. That's why I told him five. <laughs> <laughs> to spend the last hour of his life on earth. Three preachers in the room, Abernathy, King, and God. And of the three, I am the only one left. And so the world is that, what did three preachers do in a room for an hour? I said, we talk preacher talk. <laughs> So what preacher talking? I said, what well, preacher talking? Lighthearted. 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 was still shaking. Martin was telling jokes. I was telling jokes. He said, now, if a preacher can't tell a joke, don't fool me. He can't preach either. <laughs> <laughs> he loves jokes. And so, that, that, that awful moment was coming. Where I was still in the room, Martin and I walked out on the balcony. The courtyard was full of people. We came, he came out of the room. Martin and King stood here and I stood here. He saw Jesse Jackson. Martin saw Jesse. He said, Jesse, you're not dressed for dinner. Jesse said, I don't need a shirt and tie. I got an appetite. That's all I need. <laughs> and then, Jesse said, I want you to meet Ben Branch. He's a, he's a musician. He's going to play for you tonight. He said, bring him over here. So they started walking towards the balcony. Martin's here and I'm here. They started walking towards the balcony. And, and he was leaning over, meeting Ben Branch, who was a musician. I said, guys, come on, let's go. We have a rally tonight after dinner. I turned and, and, and was going to the stairs. I never got to the stairs. I turned and walked about five steps. The shot rang out. I looked back. He had been knocked from the railing back onto the floor. There was a gaping hole in the right side of his face. There was a bigger wound under his shirt. I could not see, but there was so much blood. I'm told the bullet is called a dumb dumb. As it goes through the barrel of the gun, it eats up. It doesn't come out straight. It mushroomed and it tore all of his chest out and just blood everywhere. I went in the room to call an ambulance. You have to use the operator. You can't use the phone without the operator. When she heard the shot, she left the switchboard, came out into the yard, looked up and saw that came on the floor. She had a heart attack immediately. <laughs> she died two days later. She was the boat that was right. I ran back outside. The police were coming. I hollered to them, call an ambulance on the police radio. Dr. King has been shot. And they said, where did the shot come from? So there's a famous picture of us pointing to the building across the street. The police came and stopped people from coming to the balcony. I had no words then to describe how I felt. I was doing what needed to be done, but I was doing it for functionality. Finally, the airline came and I told him what hospital to take him to. I took a crushed cigarette from his hand. He didn't want children to see him smoke. He was going to light him when he got in the car. And when the bullet hit him, he squeezed it. I took a 
backwards from his pocket. And my anger, anger is just filled with blood. I don't know where it is, it's somewhere in my possession. I was doing what needed to be done, but I wasn't aware of it. I, just, I was doing it. Finally, I told the young man where to take him, and they did. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. Finally, the word came. We never said the word yet or die. <coughs> we lost him. We lost him. Forty-some years ago, and I still remember it with the And I wonder, why was I there? Of all the places I could have been, all the places he could have been, we were close and spent time together. But why was I there at that moment in time? And over the years, God revealed to me why I was there. And it was like I had laid a heavy word down. Crucifixion, God said, I witnessed it. And I was there to be a witness, not a lying witness, but an honest witness, because a lying witness is dangerous. A witness who has information and won't share it is of no consequence. I was there to be an honest witness, and my witness must be true. Murder the people who didn't die in some foolish, untoward way. He didn't overdose. He wasn't shot by a jealous lover. He wasn't shot to leave the scene of a crime. He was a man who had earned the 18th degree at 28. A Nobel Peace Prize, the youngest at that time, to ever get one, 34. All the court was still off the charts. All the things he could have been. Union ambassador, university president, all the things he could have been. And here he is dying on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, helping garbage workers. They said, we will shoot this dreamer. And see what happens to his dream. That's where the witness comes in again. The witness will come out of the wilderness. Yes, unfortunately, you can kill the dreamer. But I hurry along to tell you absolutely, you cannot kill the dream. The dream. Thank <laughs> you.